I want to introduce to you uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Rodney Newman, who is the director of the Wembley Center for Continuing Education and Religion at Oklahoma City University. And uh, as I began putting the pieces together for, for this event, uh, I knew that I needed to go visit with Rod because he's uh, quite familiar with events like this and uh, being the uh, coordinator or organizer for them. And uh, when I mentioned that I had access to and Dr. Brigham agreed to be here at this time, like everyone else is like, eyes lit up. <laughs> and he was eager to be a part of this, and I was eager to have him be a part of the team uh, uh, to put this together. I present him now to you that he might introduce the members of the family. Rob, thank you. Uh, despite Uber Heschel Cal 
Kathleen Levy Mass and more recent contributors, Jewish thinkers have tended to other genres, especially Bible commentary. To be concrete about this, uh, the outstanding work of medieval Jewish thought, Maimonides' Guide of the Perplex, purported merely, quote, to clarify certain terms occurring in the books of prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Professor Brueggemann had that thing, very Maimonidean here, and clarifying some of those terms. Uh, the Zohar, the outstanding work of Jewish medieval mysticism, is organized as a Bible commentary too, especially the narrative parts. Even pastorally, homiletically, uh, the go-to work for rabbis who like to sermonize as much as ministers uh, is the Midrash, a compendium of Bible exegesis. So there's plenty of theology in Judaism, but uh, if I make a couple of comments to Professor Brueggemann's book on non-theological uh, grounds, I hope you'll, you'll accept that. I want mainly to thank Professor Brueggemann for his great sensitivity to the issue uh, that has traditionally made Jewish and Christian collaborative readings of scripture so difficult, and that is supersessionism. It's hardly the first time Professor Brueggemann has addressed this issue. Uh, in his book, An Unsettling God, uh, he writes, quote, I suggest that a Christian reading of the Old Testament requires, in the present time, a recovery of the Jewishness of our ways of reading the text. Whereas a recurring Christian propensity is to give closure to our readings and interpretations, it is a recurringly Jewish theme to recognize that our readings are always provisional because there's always another text, always another commentary, always another midrash. Professor Brueggemann has internalized this himself, but it's a great boon that he shares this with the lay readers, and uh, I am uh, very grateful to him. Uh, in uh, Journey to the Common Good, uh, Professor Brueggemann avoids supersessionist readings in a number of uh, uh, ways that uh, open dialogue rather than foreclose it. Among them, the acknowledgement that Judaism has its own rituals and mechanisms for abundance, hope, and restoration. Acknowledgement that the Hebrew Bible is Hebrew, in Hebrew, and that words <laughs> like chesed, mishpat, and tzedakah, beautifully translated by him as steadfast love, justice, and righteousness, respectively, need to be grasped in their original to fully heed the lessons of a passage such as Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, one of the great prophetic utterances. Thirdly, acknowledgement that the Hebrew Bible speaks first and foremost to its own time. The Bible may speak to later ages, that's a matter of faith and one that I share, but there is no doubt that in Christian interpretive history, Hebrew Bible has sometimes been taken to speak mainly about Jesus alone. Professor Brueggemann makes this point sharply in his comments on Isaiah 53, and I commend that to all, while the suffering servant of Isaiah has been read by the church as a prophecy of Jesus' sufferings and redeeming death, this was probably not the historical event in the mind of Second Isaiah. Though the church may read Second Isaiah in the perspective of Jesus, it must acknowledge that this cannot be the only reading of this passage. So my first question for Dr. Brueggemann is what still needs to be done in terms of getting Jews and Christians to read Scripture together. Having acknowledged that Isaiah comes from <laughs> <laughs> having, having, really, having, having acknowledged uh, that Isaiah comes from a particular place in time, Professor Brueggemann goes on to say, quote, but of course we take it as scripture, as a disclosure from elsewhere, as a gift that keeps on giving. For that reason I suggest that while not generic, the scripture is paradigmatic and may be given concrete replication at other times and places. Amen. Uh, rather, uh, I want to make an imaginative extrapolation about the city of Jerusalem in a way that does not move directly to the New Testament, but may have a larger appeal. So my second question is, who is it with this we, and how can this larger appeal be ex expanded, as Professor Brueggemann and I too would like? Uh, can a reading of scripture include not only Jews, but the far larger category of secularists, agnostics, and probably the biggest group of all, the self-proclaimed
something spiritual who are often scripturally illiterate. <laughs> Journey. <laughs> Journey to the common good highlights an issue. All contemporaries agree that we have something to say to the Bible, but there seems to me a divide between those who believe, believe the Bible still has something to say to us and compels a listening ear, and those who no longer think that this is the case. I suspect that I can walk into the ballot box with Professor Brueggemann and makes it half a But I doubt that most Bible readers in this part of the country, or even the majority of them, could say the same. Moreover, can Professor Brueggemann's hermeneutic, with its admirable, wonderful, open-ended way of reading scriptures, compete with the fire and burnstone creatures that seem to dominate the airways, the radio, and TV? Thank you very much.
number of the women's voices in the text. And the reason is because the, um, those imperative forms, or even just uh, the second person masculine plural form, we don't really hear them in the English. But uh, what we might miss is that usually the audience for what we've read in um, uh, the Pentateuch and the Prophets and uh, uh, many of the writings, the, the audience is assumed to be male. And so that, that uh, uh, female point of view is just lost. It just seems to be absent, except uh, it seeps out in some significant ways. And so we have to really work hard to recover it. Um, now the next one is the universalist hermeneutic. I, I have identified it that way. It really gets at Alan's second question um, about um, can your articulation here uh, apply to those who identify themselves as spiritual but not religious, or even those outside of the Judeo-Christian, even Muslim, uh, tradition, you aren't going to claim even the Exodus story or even know it, maybe. So, uh, how do we engage them in the conversation? And um, for that, I wanted to name uh, Ibu Patel, who's coming to Oklahoma City University this fall, and he's been on my mind a lot. And uh, uh, his articulation of, of how different religious groups can come together and talk to each other, working toward the common good. Um, so uh, how can we articulate these things in ways that are persuasive to those who don't claim these texts as common, who don't know them? Now that I want to take to uh, an, another hermeneutic, uh, which is my professor of pastors hermeneutic. So uh, many of my students are undergraduates who are serving in churches or who will serve in churches, and others of my students are seminary students are or will be serving in churches. And um, I just really loved how you said that when the um, prophets said therefore, then they got ready to duck. And the reason I like that is because I think that uh, uh, those of us who are, are clergy or lay people or speaking to people of faith, we need to practice that ducking exercise more often. Maybe that's my exercise book to write. Um, I think that, uh, I, I mean, I'm condemning myself here too, but I think that we do not nearly enough say stuff that we would need to duck after we say it or before we say it. Um, we, we're way too nice uh, from the pulpit or in the classroom or so forth. Um, and uh, uh, what... What we learn, I, I want my students to teach what they learn. And I've heard so many clergy not teach what I know they learned. And it's because it's hard. And because we think people don't want to hear it, but look at everybody here today. You know, people do want to hear it. It's liberating stuff. Um, so that's the professor or pastor terminated. My final one is the pacifist terminated. And this gets at questions more uh, related to our <coughs> presentation last night on the Exodus. And um, the thing that just kept bothering me is, is the question, is it possible to make the journey to the common good without leaving a bunch of dead Egyptian firstborn sons and soldiers in our wake? Um, I, I like how you help us see that we are not just people escaping from slavery, but we are also Pharaoh. That's all mixed up. We're not aware enough of that. But in our context, in the United States of America, uh, we are Pharaoh way more than we are the people on the Exodus, I think. And um, I think that we leave a lot more dead Israelites, I would hazard to say, or what collateral damage maybe we should say in our way that we are possibly aware of. I mean, I just think so many of us live in this denial fog that we're at war. Right? We're at war, you know? And um, it happens far away. It happens um, through, as somebody mentioned, drones last night. Um, and, and the 
that violence part of it, boy, we, we, we've got to grapple with that.
anybody that we're doing interpretation that doesn't intend to wound, it seems to me is not very easy. Because we are habitual wounders. But I just think we have to expose the fire and brimstone people as frauds who are basically operating out of fear.
we all get where we can get when we're able to get there, and we can't get there earlier than that. <laughs> so pastors, pastors have to be incredibly patient. And it's easy for me to say this, but pastors also shouldn't be cowards. And I, uh, Ed, Ed Friedman, his last book was entitled uh, Failure of Nerve. And he chided pastors for wanting to be liked too much. <coughs> so, uh, you know, pastors are always deciding what risks have to be run. But my hunch is that we are in a time when we have to run more risks than we used to think we had to run. Because uh, the crisis is now so urgent. And every good pastor knows that after you run that kind of a risk of truth telling, then you've got to give people a lot of room to receive what they're able to receive. Ezekiel has this wonderful uh, syllogism about being a prophet. He says, uh, if you warn them and they don't listen, it's their problem. <laughs> if you don't warn them, their blood is on your head. So the prophet doesn't have to do everything. to work together to 
understand uh, a different a different pot of wine for Bible reading. And actually, I think the Jewish way. I'm not surprising that it, I'm not surprised it's appealing to you because so much of what this lovely book is about is about the process. And for 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 a Jewish reading of the Bible, it's mainly about the process. <laughs> Uh, the actual bottom line we saw in, by the system of halacha, the system of practice, and that that kind of solves the problem of what we actually have to do. And uh, now let's have some fun to read this text. Um, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, the whole the whole issue of uh, Israel, which you mentioned, and therefore I have to respond to. Um, I think it's a very, a very difficult problem, uh, and uh, I think I would uh, would agree that the, uh, and again, I'm doing exactly what I said in my introdu self-introduction that I would not do, which is to speak for other Jews, but I'm about to do it. <laughs> um, we uh, are, uh, in fact, in the horns of a dilemma of wishing to be tough with the government of Israel, or the various governments of Israel, um, but uh, just as committed um, to the other horn, which is is knowing that that state remains for the Jewish people uh, an important asylum accomplishment statement of uh, our covenant. Uh, and our lives, even after um, a, as you pointed out yourself, a pretty concerted effort to wipe them out. Uh, so we can never give up. Um, we can never give up that side of the picture either, or fail to present it to the public. Yeah. Uh, Comment on your comment on my reading from Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 this uh, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Uh, Bernard Childs, you know, wrote a magisterial condemnation of my exegesis, in which he said I was the first Christian interpreter that departed from the true tradition on that text, so I felt uh, greatly confirmed. <laughs>
staff with earlier, we just have to keep teaching. And um, I think that's what we all have to do. We have to keep teaching. I just uh, want to thank you both. Uh, to thank Alan for giving us a piece of Shabbat. This is very generous of you. And uh, I assume you could have spent some hours with your preschoolers. Very generous of you. And I'm grateful. I, I want to. My last comment is about persistence. Uh, you know, Jesus uh, taught this parable about teaching, about, about praying, about this woman that nagged and nagged and nagged the judge till she got justice. And an amazing example of this last week, did you see this Tennessee legislator who submitted a bill that his students grades went down, that family would get less of a welfare check. And it was an eight-year-old girl that went to the uh, legislature capital and followed that legislature around all day, witnessing to him about how unjust that was. And he it was all on camera. He kept trying to turn away and she kept after him until he finally withdrew his bill. <laughs> and, and Jesus says, Jesus says, if you pray like that, you will never lose heart. And that's what it's about. It's not losing heart. <laughs>